we can say we're good at listening, but actually being good at listening is an entirely different matter, and we'll elaborate on that a little later. And uh, in this case, Charlie Brown thinks that uh, he'll remind Lucy of her promise to change and be better, um, including listening better, and all she can say is what? Which means, of course, she hadn't been listening to him say it at all. Anyway, we'll uh, come back to that topic a little later. For those of you who either weren't here two weeks ago or didn't have the opportunity to watch it on your uh, computer or whatever, last uh, class we dealt with mainly the four topics the problem of human nature. We spent a fair bit of time on that. I know it's a bit negative, but to me it was absolutely crucial to understanding why relationships can be difficult and why sometimes they can result in conflict. And we're talking about two individuals, we're talking about um, a couple in marriage, or we're talking about a brother or sister in the meeting, or we're talking about conflict within the ecclesia, this ecclesia, or even between two different ecclesias, all different ways in which this problem can be a very hard one for us to cope with. And we then looked, as a more positive point, about God and relationships. In other words, we were stressing the fact that the reason why God created a man and woman was that they would have to understand what it meant to be in a relationship so that they could then understand what it means to be in a relationship with the creator, which is far more significant. We talked a bit about ecclesia and marriage and family and uh, I had hoped to get as far as talking about love on the end and I had to cut that short. So we'll add a little bit more to the beginning in a moment to that topic to round that off. But tonight we're going to revisit this issue of God and relationships in a somewhat different way, but it's another aspect that I th want to and I think it's important for us to think about. And then I'm going to briefly talk about the problem we have of what I call ecclesial avoidance. That is, ecclesias can find a situation so difficult that in fact they can't deal with it at all. And we have a scriptural precedent for saying that and you can draw your conclusion as to whether you think it's a problem today or not. I'm not going to accuse you of that or any other ecclesia, but it's clearly something that could be happening. And then we're going to spend a bit of time, as I've alluded to already, on communication. I think we'll see, when we look at that, that good or bad communication makes an enormous difference. Good communication can significantly reduce any difficulties in a marriage or between a brother or a sister or whoever in the meeting or between ecclesias. But bad communication absolutely makes it practically impossible because you really don't understand each other and therefore there's no basis for coming to a resolution. So we then want to look, and it's really a very rushed section, but one we needed to do, look at of course is how do we minimise any kind of problems between individuals and within an ecclesia or between ecclesias? You could spend all night on that, I suppose, and still not cover it. So all I'm doing, in fact, all I'm doing with all of this is highlighting key points, each of which could be easily expanded and probably should be in certain situations. And then because of the reading, uh, you might have guessed that uh, we're going to look at the issue of the judgment seat. 
because what I'm going to show you, I hope, uh, and it's certainly something I feel quite strongly about, that although in a way we don't know a lot about the judgment seat, how it will actually function, uh, what will actually be discussed, we're going to look at several verses that make it pretty clear that the principal thing, the principal thing at judgment is how you have treated your brother or sister. And that's a pretty sobering thought in the context of this subject we're dealing with. But on the other hand, if you have reason to think you have a good relationship with each other, whether in a marriage, family, this ecclesia, with other ecclesias, then that's a good thing, isn't it? And that's a, a reassuring thing. Okay, well, as I said, we, we didn't really quite cover the topic of love last time, but let's have a look at John 13, which was alluded to last time, but um, didn't have really the time I wanted to stress it as it should be. So in John 13, we're looking at verses 34 and 35. The Lord makes some, as he often does, some pretty astounding things in, in his instructions to the disciples. Things that if he hadn't said it, we probably wouldn't be game to say it. They're, they're so out there, so almost extreme that if it wasn't coming from the mouth of the Lord himself, we would have difficulty with it. So verse 34 of John 13. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Well, the first thing to notice is he says it three times, to love one another. Well, didn't we get it the first time? But even there you can see that he almost anticipates the fact that we would say, that you're going a little bit too far here, Lord, that, that's just a bit out there. You know, that you don't quite mean that, surely. Well, saying it three times, it's pretty obvious he does mean it. And he says that all people will know that you are my disciples by that standard that you love one another. Now, that's not how we would normally think about this issue. We, we would say, well, people would know um, that we're the disciples of Christ by uh, seeing us come to the meeting or by the fact that we don't swear or uh, don't get drunk every Friday night at the, after work or all sorts of things that we might think of, but probably wouldn't have thought of this one. So that's a very strong statement. Incidentally and interestingly, historically, that was true. Here's a part of what a um, historian of the um, early believers has written. There are six topics. You've only got three shown there on the slide that were noted by people who were contemporary with the first believers. They were a close-knit structure of believers as a social group. They were persecuted. They had the answer to the quest for true happiness. Now that's pretty interesting. We're not going to talk about that. But the next one, they were known to have demonstrated love one for another. That's a historian looking at records from the period of the apostles and a little after of how the society around them, how the Roman authorities, etc. saw these Christians. What were they like? And number four on that list is exactly what Jesus said. And the other two gave women equality and gave slaves equal status. All of those were so unusual, all of them, 
that they were noted at the time by contemporary people. And then just one other verse, if you come with me to Philippians. Um, most, I'm pretty sure all of the verses we look at tonight and did, to, did last time are fairly familiar to us. They're not, there's nothing strange about the passages we're going to look up. But in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, The Apostle says, fulfil my joy by being like-minded. So there's a key point. We have to be of the same mind, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Again, you see the Apostles coming at it from every direction, but in every case it's one. There's unity here. Verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Well, that's covered by a lot of the topics we looked at last time. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now, that's pretty hard to do because I know I'm actually better than you, don't I? You know, it, <laughs> it sounds silly, but you, I'm trying to get you to think about this. Do you really, really think every other brother and sister is better than you? Is that how you treat them? The word is the same word that Peter uses to describe the respect we show to the king, the, re the emperor. Is that how we treat each other? Is that really how you feel about one another? that they are worthy of so much more attention and respect and honour and so on and so on than you are? Well, of course, if everyone did that, it would be perfect, wouldn't it? There wouldn't possibly be any difficulties in our relationships. There wouldn't be any conflict. So, you see, it's sort of verse we can read pretty slowly and go, oh, yeah, it's lovely. Thanks, Paul. Move on. It really makes you stop and think. It should do anyway. Because so many things in Scripture hit us where it hurts. It cuts right across our instincts, our human nature. Okay, moving on. Coming back to explore this God and relationships. Um, you'll see in a moment on the next slide, actually, the source that I get this from. It's a fascinating book, uh, which got reprinted, fortunately, because it's fairly old. But let me just take you through these two slides where I'm going to quote from this particular author. And the general way of introducing it is to know God, not self. Okay? Okay. In the New Testament teaching as to the effective working of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, we see most clearly the difference between the Hebrew and the Greek attitudes to life. And just one little point before I move on. We know the New Testament's written in Greek. But what we may not think often, is it's not a Greek book. It's written in that language, but it's a Hebrew book. And we can make some very poor interpretations if we forget that. And that's exactly why things like the Trinity arose, because they read the Greek New Testament as reflecting Greek ideas. And it's nothing of the sort. The New Testament is reflecting Hebrew ideas. There's no difference between the Old and the New Testament understanding of God, of our relationships with him and with one another. Nothing at all different. It just happens to have been put into the Greek language because that was the world language at the time, like it is English nowadays or perhaps Chinese, it's a bit of a competition as to who, who are the most frequent speakers of language today. So that's the point behind this, that 
we have to be very, very careful we don't misunderstand the New Testament because we are reflecting Greek ideas instead of Hebrew ones. I could talk about that for a while, but I'll move on. And he stresses, they are fundamentally different. The object and aim of the Hebrew system is da'ath Elohim, knowledge of God. That's what the Bible's about. It's telling us what God is like, what his purpose is, how we are to relate to him. It's all about God. It's not about us. We are not the focus of the Bible. God is the focus. The object and aim of the Greek system is nothi suton, to know thyself. So Greek philosophy spent millions of hours discussing and debating about the human, the soul, the spirit, the psyche. The Bible doesn't do that. It's all about God. The Greek thinking is all about me. And that's a huge difference. And we do need to keep that in mind and be reminded from time to time. Between these two, there is the widest possible difference. There is no compromise between the two on anything like equal terms. They are poles apart in attitude and method. The Hebrew system starts with God. The only true wisdom is knowledge of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9 verse 10. The corollary is, that is what follows from that, is that man can never know himself what he is and what is his relation to the world, sorry, unless first he learn of God and be submissive to God's sovereign will. I appreciate this something, if you haven't thought about it before or haven't heard this before, it takes a while to absorb this. The Greek system, on the contrary, starts with the knowledge of man and seeks to rise to an understanding of the ways and nature of God through the knowledge of what is called man's higher nature. So the Greek thinking was... By thinking myself, perhaps by discussion, I, I will then understand something about God. And it's not just the Greek system, it's all in the Eastern religions, Asian religions as well. well. Buddhism, for example, is a very good example of this totally opposite position compared to the scriptures. According to the Bible, man has no higher nature except that he be born of the Spirit. In other words, our human nature that we talked about last time has absolutely no position, no status, no place in God's system. But unfortunately, we're stuck with it. And we know why we're stuck with it. It goes right back to Genesis 3, as we're well aware. But just come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is really what this whole chapter is about, exactly what we've been discussing. Um, we're only going to look at one verse because, again, we could spend quite a long time on it. But you may recall, it if you, if you don't, when you look at the chapter, it'll probably ring a bell. It's all about wisdom. And, of course, the Greeks loved this. They could talk about it till the cows came home. They would talk about it on every day, forever and ever, and never really know God at all. But they loved talking about wisdom, where human thinking was going, how they could rise to a higher level by their own efforts and so on. And the Apostle Paul does what this writer did. As you can see on the screen, a fellow called Norman Snaith, I wrote a book back in 1944, but I've got a reprint, which is fortunate. Just have a look at verse 21 to see the, the thrust of what Paul's saying here. 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, its own wisdom, did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So you can see that's exactly what this chapter in 1 Corinthians is all about. Get it, totally reject the whole Greek thinking, their philosophy, their ideas. And as I've said already, sometimes if you just pick up a concordance and look at somebody's definition of a Greek word, be careful, it might not reflect the Hebrew be behind that word. And this, this particular author does that. He shows what the Hebrew concept behind the Greek word is. I don't know that's getting a little bit complex, but for those of you who like to delve into things, it's really worthwhile. Okay, well now we're moving on to our second topic tonight, what we called ecclesial avoidance. So if you just turn a couple of pages to chapter 5, we have this example. We're not going to look at the chapter in detail, but it's just the one that's relevant. This ecclesia was dealing with a very severe problem. Verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man had his father's wife. And he goes on and, and really tells the Corinthians very severely that you should not be hiding this, you should not be avoiding it, you shouldn't be treating it as unimportant. And we're, we're not going to go into that. But it's, a, it's an example of where an ecclesia didn't know how to deal with it, couldn't face it, tried to minimise it when it should have been dealt with as a very severe problem, which it was. Now, this gets a little bit difficult here because how do we judge that? Well, let's just think about it a little more, particularly the problem that existed here in Corinth because it's all around the world today. And I mean within religious circles. We know that, don't we? It's in the media all the time. There's now a, a government fund set up to pay people who've been mistreated by churches, by religions. So <laughs> this hasn't changed. And so other religious groups and society in general have difficulty dealing with those sort of issues. Now think about the Old Testament. There's some extraordinary examples here. You look back at the time of Joseph or even a little bit earlier, Judah. Some horrible, immoral things. Back to the time of, uh, well, forward to the time of David. There were some horrible things happening. And the Old Testament doesn't whitewash it, doesn't hide it. It says, there it is, for a good reason. We cannot pretend this won't happen to us or this won't happen to me because it does and it has. And that's why the scriptures are written like they are. And it isn't just the negative stuff, it's sometimes the, the more positive stuff. I remember a brother said to me some time ago when his children were young that when it came to reading through Song of Solomon, they would skip it. They wouldn't read that because he found it too embarrassing, too difficult to explain to his children what it was all about. And we can do that, not so much in refusing to read the verse, but refusing to discuss what it means and recognise when it happens and deal with it. There's no benefit in avoiding things because they'll come back and bite you harder than they may have the first time you became aware of them. The New Testament has many examples, many examples of the immorality and worldliness of the Roman Empire times and the apostles particularly warning the ecclesias all over the Roman Empire, be careful, these things will come into the ecclesia and you have to deal with them. 
You can't hide them, you can't avoid them. And so my question to us all is, do we adequately prepare individuals in baptiz- for baptism? What I mean by that is, do we cover relationship issues, personal and ecclesia? Do we adequately prepare couples for marriage on the same issues? I, I, you can't answer that for you and I don't want you to answer it for me. It's, it's your ecclesia, not mine. But each ecclesia has to think through those things. It's all very well teaching a young person first principles, but at least we must cover relationship issues, what it's like to, have, to grow up and live in this world we live in and how to deal with it. And if we get into difficulties, how to then proceed? Do we hide it or do we confess it? How do we, who do we talk to? How do we deal with this? These things need to be understood by everyone from children upwards. But we have some benefits in this era. Our ecclesias have got better at at least acknowledging problems do exist. We have a number of resources, a couple of websites there I've just put, put up that provide a lot of resources to help anyone, not necessarily an ecclesia, but individuals can access this and get some ideas, some help. I remember a few years ago at Aberfoyle Park, we had a, a Sunday evening session which was aimed at our young people. We had a huge number of young teenagers at the time on drugs and alcohol. And somebody from another meeting was a bit perturbed by that and said, oh, you've got a problem at Aberfoyle Park, have you? Oh. And we said, no, we're just trying to avoid one. We're trying to stop it coming by at least having our young people understand it, understand the biblical principles, why it's important, rather than just hope it doesn't come. Because when it does, they're not prepared. It's all about preparation. I think part of the problem is that we have a feeling that our ecclesias should, in a sense, be perfect. You might find that an odd statement to, for me to make. But our community, since it began 170-odd years ago, has often been very concerned about what is called purity of doctrine and practice. And you might say, well, that's a great thing. Surely that's what we should all be trying to do. But unfortunately, very often, that was used as a weapon. Because obviously, I've got pure doctrine and I've got pure behaviour, haven't I? And if you disagree with me, then you clearly don't, so out you go. And that's very simplistically what happened all too often and I think still does occasionally. I've just got a couple of quotations from Christadelphian writings many years ago, so not contemporary ones that I've picked on so anyone could be feel like I'm picking on them. The maintenance of purity of fellowship within the one body is the joint responsibility of all ecclesias. Purity of fellowship. I'll come back to that one. Here's another one. We shall stand for purity and strictness in respect of the standards of our faith and shall set out month by month definite and uncompromising articles on first principles and cardinal points of doctrine. Well, the latter part sounds straightforward enough. But notice this word purity. It implies that the ecclesia that the person who wrote that belonged to is absolutely pure. There is no one in that ecclesia that is even the slightest bit off the straight and narrow. 
Now I've lived long enough to realise there is no such an ecclesia in the world, never has been. But you see, by saying that, you can set up a system that enables you to exclude people very easily because, well, you disagree on that, you must be impure on that point because I'm pure. Upholding the purity of apostolic doctrine and faith. Don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting we should have wrong doctrine, not at all. You hopefully know me better than that. It's just that by stressing these, this particular word in certain ways, we can set up a system, and it's happened, which makes us the arbiter of what every brother and sister in the world should believe and practice. Which is why, when that's carried through, you have a division in the brotherhood. And if you're in the group that feels like that, after a few years, you have another division. And if you're in the group that feels you've got the purity, then after a few more years, that group splits again. I've got a publication. It's a great publication on fellowship by a brother, Matt Davies, from Nottingham. It's online free if you want to look it up. That he was in a fellowship of five people. Five in the whole world because they were the pure ones. He's now in our fellowship, the Central Fellowship in the UK. He happened to have done a study on fellowship for that little group and went, uh-oh, we've got it completely wrong. So that may influence the way we deal with difficulties because if it becomes known somewhere else that we have this problem, oh, we, we might think they're going to look down on us. So, oh, well, we won't, we won't let this out. We won't face up to this because that will become well known to others. Are we embarrassed by failures amongst us? The key here, I think, is honesty. To be honest. Those two references, I won't turn them up. Daniel, that's a prayer of Daniel. Now we know what Daniel was like. Absolutely amazing brother. So what does he say in his prayer? We have sinned. He wasn't there saying, oh God, they've sinned, but I didn't. It was, we've sinned. I'm part of this Group, we have sinned. James talks about confessing our trespasses to one another. And I think many of us, if we were in a position where we ought to be doing that, might not want to because, well, we, I don't want to tell you because I know you're going to blab and tell everyone else. So this whole issue of confidentiality comes in and we're not I'm not developing that tonight. We must talk about issues before they grow and get out of hand. You know there's an old saying prevention is better than cure. And this is what it's all about. Preventing things to getting to a point where we have a major relationship problem and a conflict is far better then wait until it suddenly bursts out and then try and fix the mess afterwards. Very much more difficult. Ecclesial perfection, just developing this thought a bit more. Should we attempt to eliminate every impurity in the ecclesia? And you might, initially, if I hadn't said anything yet, but this is the first thing I mentioned, you might go, well, yeah, of course. We must, we can't have impurities in, in the ecclesia. Well, this quotation is from Brother John Thomas to Robert Roberts. Do you expect poor, decrepit human nature to evolve holier influences now than it was socially capable of under an apostolic ministration of spirit? I believe you do not. 
It would be a very pleasant if there were none in Christadelphia but the called, the faithful and the chosen, all of one mind and with one mind and one mouth glorifying God. If all understood the truth and were governed by it, who professed to believe it, there would be a very different state of things to what has obtained in any age or generation, past or present. But ecclesiastical perfection is not to be expected in the absence of Christ on the earth, that means. Well, that's, that's pretty strong language. Till he comes, the wheat will be mingled with the tares in such proportion as to keep the faithful in tribulation and the exercise of patience. The kingdom of the heavens preached is still parabolically a net cast into the sea and gathering all sorts of fish, good, bad and indifferent. When the net is full, it is landed to shore, onto shore and its contents are sorted by the master. All the good fish are gathered into vessels for his use, but the bad are cast away. This arrangement cannot be altered. The good and bad fish will continue to swim in the same waters until the end comes, and that end, it is to be hoped, is very near. For it is by no means pleasant or comfortable to swim in waters full of sharks and serpents of the sea. Well, because that's, you know, slightly amusing language, isn't it? And we, are, we know what it's like to swim in a sea with sharks because we get them here. Now, brother, you, you know enough about Brother Thomas to know that he was not suggesting that we water down the truth. He wasn't saying, you know, we shouldn't aspire to higher things. Of course not. But he is it's saying that we cannot make perfect ecclesias. You've probably heard, whether it's... I haven't heard the source of this, but it's said that Harry Tennant has said that um, if you want to find a perfect ecclesia, don't go there because you will make it imperfect. Something to that effect. And that, that's really the same point. And here's another comment similarly, I suppose, from Brother Robert Roberts. Fellowship is friendly association for the promotion of a common object with more or less of the imperfection belonging to all mortal life. To say that every man in that fellowship is responsible for every infirmity of judgment that may exist in the association is an extreme to which no man of sound judgment can lend himself. There will be flawless fellowship in the perfect state Perhaps it is the admiration of this in prospect that leads some to insist upon it now. But it is none the less a mistake. This is a mixed and preparatory state in which much has to be put up with when true principles are professed. Now I think a lot of that is all about being patient with one another. Being careful with one another. Not lopping our heads off at the first indiscretion. But working as hard as we can to help that individual or help that couple or help that ecclesia. But Australians aren't really known for that, are we? You've heard of the tall poppy syndrome which is not the perfect analogy for this, but I've I mentioned that because that's the idea of chopping the heads off to bring everyone down to the same level, although in practice that's nonsense, we don't do that at all. Um, but the point with all of this about the way the ecclesias deal with problems 
is that the more open and honest we are, the more caring we are, the more we discuss the risks of practical life, the less problems we're going to have because we will be seen as a safe place to be. And just one, I think, one more on this. Yes, one more on this point. You may be aware of a very interesting article by Robert Roberts in the last year of his life, an article called True Principles and Uncertain Details or the Danger of Going Too Far in Our Demands on Fellow Believers. And what he was doing was distinguishing between what we might call our core principles, our core doctrines, things like, you know, God is one. We don't have an immortal soul. You know, those sort of really, really basic things and a whole lot of others. But then there's a whole lot of other stuff where we go, well, I think it's this and you think it's that and have a good discussion about it. And he said those secondary things should never get in the way of fellowship, should never be used to divide ecclesias. And you might be surprised at some of the things on his list. Just look at number three, for example. What was man's state after creation and before sin? What does it mean to be very good? That has divided ecclesias. That very issue. It did it in Australia over 100 years ago. Look at number eight down the bottom. The devil, who or what tempted Jesus? That has caused divisions. It caused the division, particularly in Victoria, many years ago. Now, you might disagree with Robert Roberts. You're entitled to. Here's a few more. And uh, number 12 is interesting. What size and shape is the temple in the kingdom? You might think that's absolutely no debate on that. Well, that's fine. What Robert Roberts is saying, that's not a test of fellowship. Because if you've got the wrong picture in your head, are you going to get to the kingdom and say, excuse me, God, you've got it wrong? No, you're not, are you? You'll accept whatever size and shape the temple is. You'll just be so thrilled to be there. So therefore, be careful about what we demand of one another. And the last one who's going to be raised, he was making it clear that the principle of knowledge brings responsibility. That's a core principle. But what he was saying is you can't then say, well, that group or that individual will or won't be raised because we can't say that. We can say what the principle is, absolutely right. But we aren't the ones who are going to actually decide who is raised and who isn't. Okay, communication. I counted 180 verses in the Proverbs that deal with communication, good and bad. That's a huge number. It's obviously a big issue in the Bible. But what do we mean by communication? Well, it's the sharing of information with another person in such a way that he or she understands what you are saying. It is not just talking. When I was uh, doing training in the Philippines, one of my career jobs, I would say to the group that I was working with the first time I met them, if you don't understand what I'm saying, it's my fault. Tell me so I can correct that, so I can explain it better. It's not your fault if you don't understand me. It's my fault. I need to communicate in a way that you understand. I'm not perfect at it. I'm trying hard tonight to be clear but it's not always possible to be that all the time, is it? But that should be our aim. And if you have difficulty with what I'm saying or an audience has difficulty with what you're saying or your wife doesn't understand what you're saying, etc., etc., 
then you do something about it. It's not the other person's fault. And that brings us to the issue of listening. We could look at a lot of verses. We don't have time for that. James 1 verse 19 says exactly this. Listen more and talk less. I've got to tell you an extraordinary story. It's true. Um, The sister I'm going to quote is is not with us anymore. She passed away years ago. Um, But she identified a brother in her ecclesia that clearly wasn't listening. And he would ask her how she was when he met her and she might say something and it was obvious his eyes were looking around to who he was going to talk to next. Didn't hear anything she said. So she, to prove that, one day she said, after he said, well, how are you going? She said, oh, I'm going real well. I'm having an affair with the milkman. And he said, oh, that's nice and moved off. Had not heard a word she said. It's a hard. Th- it's actually hard to listen. Really, it is. Really listen, and think so carefully about what the other person said, that if you've got the slightest uncertainty as to what they meant, you stop them and say, "I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. Did you mean this or that? Can you explain that a bit more? That is listening." really listening, wanting to know what they're really saying. And here's a, here's a, a partial list of, of some Proverbs. Just look at that one, chapter 18, verse 13, just to make the point I made earlier about how frequent this is in the Proverbs. Proverbs 18, verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. How often does that happen? It happens all the time. We're thinking about what we're going to say before the other person's got halfway through what they're saying. We're not listening. We, in our head, have answered the issue before they've had a chance to tell us the whole story, before they've really heard it. This is not a new problem. None of these things are new problems. That is the whole benefit of the scripture. You know, if God just wanted to give us a book of first principles, it wouldn't be any bigger than that. So why have we got such a big Bible? Why have we got page after page of stories of this person and that person to teach us about life? living the truth, good and bad examples in scripture, what to do, what not to do. What an amazing thing God has done. He hasn't just given us a little booklet and said, okay, off you go, you figure out the rest of it. No, he's given a whole lot. There is nothing we need to know that's not there. And there's a a lot more, just just, uh, moving on. And when you're talking with someone, you should want to know how your friend feels. Or don't you really want to know? You just want to tell them something. You don't really want to know how they feel. Listening is receiving and accepting the message as it is sent. Don't interpret it. Don't say, oh, I know what they really mean. Well, you don't. So if you are not sure, make a little inquiry. What did you mean by that? It is seeking to understand what the other person really means, not what you think they mean. It is actively caring about what he or she says and what they want to say. It means not thinking about what you are going to say when the other person stops. So let's look at Ephesians 4. This is a a really great chapter on communication. We'll just quickly glance at a couple of verses in Ephesians 4. Verse 15, firstly. Firstly. 
but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Well, of course, we teach children, speak the truth, tell the truth. But that isn't quite what Paul said. He, he said that, but it wasn't all he said, was it? Speak the truth in love. And if I had, uh, for example, uh, one of my family here, my son, for example, and I've done this, so he won't be embarrassed by what I'm going to say now, but just suppose he was sitting here in the front row. I could say, Matthew, you're ugly. Now, suppose that was true. It's not. But just suppose it was. Is that a loving thing to say? Clearly not. Don't say it. And that's, I think, Paul's point. You speak the truth in love. Don't just say what you think is true without thinking about the effect it's going to have. And only by doing it in love will it be a reasonably appropriate thing to say. There's an old saying, if you can't say something nice about someone, don't say anything. Similar idea, I suppose. Verse 25 says, speak truth with your neighbour. And verse 29 says, let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. And what you do say should be the edification of others. And, and here's a little quote from somebody or other. I thought it was a, a neat one to put in. My goal is to speak the truth in love. There are a lot of people speaking the truth with no love. And there are a lot of people talking about love without much truth. That sums up what I'm trying to get across here. There is no sin into which it is easier to fall and no sin which has graver consequences than the sin of the tongue. Once a word is spoken, there is no getting it back. And a classic modern example of that is texting or emails or whatever you do, tweets, whatever it is. They've gone out, they're gone. You can delete it from your computer, but it went, it's gone. You can't get it back once you press send. And it's the same with normal conversation. Once you've said it, it's, it's gone. There is nothing which is so impossible to kill as a rumour. There is nothing which is so impossible to obliterate as an idle and malignant story. Let a man, before he speaks, remember that once a word is spoken, it is gone from his control, and let him think before he speaks, because although he cannot get it back, he will most certainly answer for it. That's uh, from William Barclay's commentary on James. Jesus said much the same, didn't he? What comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. It's not what we take in, it's defiling, it's what comes out. Words, that's what comes out. And if they're the wrong words, they defile you. But it's not the end of it, as we'll see in a moment. Romans 3 has quite a long quotation from the psalm. And he des it describes there that the throat of a person who's not governed by godly principles is an open tomb. What's in it? Death. And it's the poison of snakes. That, that's, that's the apostles and the Psalms' definition of our tongue, of our, of our words. James 3, the whole chapter almost, no man can tame the, the tongue. It is full of deadly poison. And you only have to listen to politicians talk to each other or abuse each other to understand that. And sadly, sometimes it can happen 
amongst us. Too often, even among the children of God, the poisonous influence of the tongue is at work. We do not ourselves sufficiently realise how potent our words are for evil. Malicious and uncharitable gossip and sordid or suggestive conversation spread their deadly poison through our own spiritual beings and into the lives alike of our hearers and our victims. So three people are poisoned by the wrong use of the mouth. You're poisoned, the person who hears what you say, and the victim that you're talking about. Again, the strength of this language, can, we can only say what we've been saying tonight because it's in the Bible. If it hadn't been, you might think I was a bit extreme. But there's a wonderful counterside to this, a lot of it in Proverbs as well, that words can give life. And in the context of those Proverbs, I think it's talking about eternal life. You can give someone eternal life. Of course you can. By instructing them on what God's message is and showing in your behaviour that you are one of his disciples. The words we use can heal people. That's an incredible thing, isn't it? Heal people. And of course, in this context, we're talking about problems in our minds and perhaps by extension, that person's behaviour. We can heal that by saying the right things. We can nourish people with our words, like trying to make a plant grow. As the Apostle picks up on that idea, doesn't he? We can water it. We can fertilise it. We can take the weeds out. We can do all. We can nourish people with our words. We can encourage them and should encourage one another with our words. There's an interesting word used by the Apostle Paul in what's called the pastoral epistles, Timothy and Titus. He talks about sound words. In the Greek, that word sound is hygiene, hygienic. And of course, you've got masks on, so we all know what hygiene is about these days, you know, using the hand sanitizer, not spreading germs, whatever, whatever. That's how our language should be to one another. And here's a, another nice quote I thought I'd put in. Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts or measure words, but pouring them all right out, just as they are, chaff and grain together, certain that the faithful hand will take and sift them, keeping what is worth keeping, and then with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. So how we respond to people's words are important, as that point is stressing. If we are really genuinely brothers and sisters in Christ and genuinely care for one another, we will not be offended by them using the wrong term or wrong words, wrong expressions, because we know them well enough to know they just got it all a bit tangled up and we will ignore that. We will blow that away. Now this one is going to be very quick because of, of time, but also realise that it, you know we could spend the whole night just on this one topic of minimising the problems. Here's a, just a few starters if you want to develop the idea further. The Apostle Paul talks about bearing one another's burdens. Well, you have to know what those burdens are, don't you? How do you get to know what burdens people are carrying? How, you can't help me if you don't know what my burdens are and if I don't tell you what they are. So if I won't tell you and you can't figure it out, that's the end of that one. It's not easy to tell a person what your burdens are, what your problems or difficulties are. Confess your trespasses one to another. 
well, we don't even, we're not going quite that far here. We're simply saying, share with people your life, what you find difficult. And then they might be able to help to carry that load for you. Hear both sides. Now, the, the quote there is before two or three witnesses. But the idea behind that is this. You can't have one. And if anyone's ever had to deal with a conflict between two individual brothers and sisters, or even two ecclesias, you can't just rely on what one of them says. So if your ecclesia had a problem with Aberfoyle Park and I was from interstate, say, I can't come along and just say, well, Cumberland, you tell me what the problem is. Right, I'll go and sort out Aberfoyle Park. No. I have to go and listen to them as well. And maybe even someone else outside of that. At least two sides to every story. And you can't rely on just one. You cannot. I, I could give examples, but I won't. Times have got away from me as usual. Edify one another. That <coughs> Excuse me, there's a lot of references to that. I've just put here in Romans 14, which we will look at because we're going to look at again in a second. So just quickly look at the one in Romans 14 that we had read earlier. Verse 19. Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. And then... 15 verse 2, let each of us please his neighbour for his good, leading to edification. A big subject. You could spend a whole evening on it. The next one is a bit perhaps curious to some of you, and that's the idea of self-esteem. I think there's been a tendency in our community to absolutely trounce this topic. No way should we have self-esteem? That sounds like puffing yourself up. It isn't. It's a misuse of that idea. Because Jesus says, of how much more value are you than the birds? And he also used another example. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. That's easier for some of us than others, of course. But um, fortunately, I've still got a reasonable amount. But the point is, our Lord knows us intimately, intimately, and he thinks you're a value, far more value than a flock of birds. You have value to the Lord. And then my treatment of you and you of me should reflect that. I'm, I'm dealing with one of God's children one of the brothers or sisters of our Lord. You're really important to me and I should treat you accordingly. And therefore, serving one another is a very common theme in scripture. Um, through love, note the word connecting back to what we started with, through love, serve one another. Pray for one another. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Not just pray for somebody who's sick or whatever, has a particular need, but for people who don't like you, who treat you badly, pray for them. That's not so easy, is it? Well, now, just to finish off with the judgment seat, uh, that's a picture of the judgment seat in Athens. Um, it's the... This bit over here. Come on. Hopefully you've got it. It's on the right-hand side there. The judgment seat is the Greek word bema. It's a, so it's a familiar term to the people in the New Testament times. So when we read verses about the judgment seat of Christ, it's the bema of Christ. It's a common idea. A place where judgment was made about all sorts of things. But what about our judgment? No, it's not going to move that here. 
maybe have run out of puff with the battery. I don't know. It shouldn't have done. It was new last time. Anyway, God is a God of loving kindness and justice. There's just one example there of Jeremiah 9. That's what God's presenting himself as. He cares for those who need help and he's absolutely fair. He's just. And there are a lot of other examples, in both in Jeremiah, Psalm 72, familiar passage, James 1, fatherless and the widows. God does and we should care for the orphans and widows, the poor and the needy. In other words, anyone who needs help of any sort, that should be fundamental to our individual and ecclesial lives. Matthew 12, our Lord says, we will be judged by our words. And you go, yeah, right, but hang on. That means our words to one another. Doesn't it? What else could it mean? Couldn't mean anything else. So what we say is a reflection of what's in our heads and what is our real mode of thought. And God sees straight into that. And the Lord himself, as representative of God at that time, sees right into our whole life. He knows what words we've used and what they are reflecting from inside us. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats chapter. Caring for the least of Christ's brethren. So the ones who need the most help, the most care are the ones that the Lord says, you are like me, come into my kingdom. Because that's what the Lord was, wasn't he? Always caring for the poor and the needy, healing people, feeding people. Now Romans 14 is one of those chapters that talks about the judgment, but just look at the context, verse 3 Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who does eat. For God has received him. We are not to despise any brother or sister. Any brother or sister, no matter what. And over in also in verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So you see the point that it is how we treated one another that is at the core of the judgment. And there's numerous references in the Apostles, John's first letter about if we hate our brother, we do not have eternal life and much more besides. 